Praise God, here we are back again on a very special, historic Yom Kippurim webcast all the way from the Elat Prayer Tower in Israel. This is part two of the Yom Kippurim webcast. If you have not watched part one, make sure that after this webcast you go back and you also find part one. It will be very important as a preparation for that which I'm going to speak right now. Now, I uh, spoke on the first part that this night I was awakened by Adonai. In other words, during this Yom Kippurim where we are fasting and praying, afflicting our souls, and I gave a whole background about Yom Kippurim in the webcast number one, so you need to see it there, uh, where Yahweh is calling us to afflict our souls during this day. It is a day of mercy, but it is a day where all of Israel is actually praying and fasting so that Yahweh will not blot them out of the Book of Life or that He will write them in the Book of Life. I've proven in the webcast, the first webcast, that the only way to be written in the Book of Life is through the blood of Yeshua. And uh, there is no other way. It's only through the blood of Yeshua. You have to go back to the first one to see that. And uh, there's no other way, but also when people have accepted the blood of Yeshua, they have accepted Yeshua the Messiah as their Savior. Um, there are many people that are duped in their really in deception thinkings that once saved is always saved. And really that it doesn't matter what you do in this life, you will not be judged. Again, in the first webcast, I amply proved that it is not so. The Word of God tells us very clearly that those that will not walk the way that Elohim is pleased, uh, those that will continue in sin, in abominations, in unrighteousness, breaking His commandments, rebellious and stubborn, they will basically, they can be blotted out out of the book of life. The Word of God tells us that we can be written there, but we can also be blotted out. And so that's very important that we, even during this Yom Kippurim, inspect our hearts, and see whether we are walking in a way that is pleasing unto Him or not pleasing unto Him. It's not about being paranoid about everything we do. It's about simply understanding that Yahweh is a holy God. And Yeshua is not only called to be a Savior, but also Lord, Adon. And Adon really means somebody that rules over you. In other words, it's not you that rules your life, but He that rules over your life. And He really would not impose His rulership over you unless you allow Him to rule. In Revelation 3, it says He's knocking at the door. If you open, He will come in, He will, have, he will dine with you. And if you don't open, then He will not be able to dine with you. He will not be able to rule in your life and have an intimate relationship with you. Therefore, we need to allow Him to rule. He will not rule by force because He's created in us self-will. Self-will that can choose life or can choose death, can choose the blessing, can choose the curse, can choose to be written in the book of life or blotted out or not written in that book of life at all. So it's very important this young people that we understand that because then we're going to understand why the church at large is in great danger. It is in great danger, number one, because of the theology called replacement theology that completely separated the Christians or the Gentile believers from the Jewish believers and it completely separated the Gentile believers from their original Jewish roots and foundations from Torah, exchanging it from a religious system that was pagan, including pagan feasts that were dressed up as if they were kosher, or as if they were godly, but they were not godly. They were Babylonian uh, kind of pagan celebrations, such as Christmas, Easter, uh, the worship on Sunday instead of Shabbat, and for many, even the worship of Halloween and other feasts of the sword. It went into a religious system that was totally mixed with paganism, where things needed to be comfortable and reasonable rather than obedience, holiness, and righteousness. It was that religious system that separated from the Jewish roots about after the Council of Nicaea established by Constantine and the Church Fathers of year 325. It is after that cut from the original Jewish faith that was handed to the people that, because you know Israel was the only one waiting for a Messiah, the Gentiles were not waiting for a Messiah. In other words, the faith, the Torah, the word, the gospel all comes from the Jews, and we know that salvation is of the Jews, so being cut off from that root 
caused great curses to come upon the church and they went into darkness and they began to humiliate and murder the Jewish people in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Christianity, all the way to the Shoah, the Holocaust that was also terribly executed through the Nazi regime in the name of Jesus Christ. Jews were expelled out of Germany with a cross on high and uh, uh, also, of course, throughout Germany, which was mostly Protestant, and Poland, which was mostly Catholic, six million Jews were exterminated, out of which uh, the, the, the almost walking skeletons of that Shoah, of that Holocaust, arrived to Israel to establish what we have today, the miracle reborn state of Israel. So now giving you that background right now, we're going to take a look at the word of Yah concerning the nations of Israel. Understanding the reason of why Yahweh has written these things in this book, it is connected with the history that the nations carry with Israel and understanding that since Constantine adopted Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire at the time, every nation that adopted Christianity and had therefore the religious system of Christianity through replacement theology, replacing Israel for the church, replacing all the Hebrew Holy Scriptures for a New Testament divorce from the Hebrew Holy Scriptures, replacing the original biblical holidays like this one for pagan holidays, replacing the name of Yeshua, which means salvation, for the name of Jesus Christ, which is actually a pagan name, uh, a Greek pagan name that reminds us of all kinds of pagan gods like Zeus and Yesu and Yesa and Yezu and others that are in the Greek pantheon of gods. We understand, therefore, that every nation that adopted that kind of Christianity then is connected with the judgment I'm going to read about. So if you're living in any one of those nations, this message is for you. That includes all of Europe and Scandinavia. It includes the United States of America. It includes Australia and New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. It includes all of South America. It includes Africa that adopted Christianity as well through uh, the, the, um, the conquerors that came to Africa. In other words, it includes the entire world that has adopted Christianity as a religion of their nation for many, many years. And that Christianity was not the original gospel made in Zion, but rather the Christianity established by Constantine and the church fathers of the fourth century. Now, Bear that in mind, it's amply clear, though most church books will not tell you about it. I, I was in Bible school in the year 1990, and I remember that I was appalled when they taught me church history, that they totally and completely bypassed all the church history of the Christianity towards the Jewish people in the nations. There was not actually one class given to me that that the Christians had killed Jews in the name of Jesus Christ, or that they, they humiliated, or for example, during the 6th century and 5th century, after the Council of Nicaea was uh, signed, and uh, Christianity was established as the religion of the Eastern Roman Empire, and then all of the Roman Empire, from, Rome, from which Roman Catholicism comes, um, that even after, for example, Jews were not even allowed to keep their own children. No, and the Jews, because they were regarded as a cursed people, and I already spoke in the webcast number one, that indeed we Jewish people were cut off from the land of Israel by the Roman armies because we were punished by Yahweh, and we were in judgment in the nations, but the believers in the nations, instead of standing in the gap for us, they actually went ahead and they became the prosecutor. And so we need to understand that through Christianity, the church became the prosecutor of the Jewish people instead of the intercessor for the Jewish people. I likened it in the first webcast as to your mother. Israel is our mother because from Israel gave birth to the church. Actually, the church was born, the ecclesia, uh, the body of Yeshua was born in Jerusalem. The body of Yeshua uh, uh, would not be the body of Yeshua, would not be able to be saved unless the Jewish people brought the Torah and the Word of Yah and also the Messiah that was born of a Jewish woman's womb and of course the gospel that was brought by the Jewish apostles to the nations starting from Cornelius that was preached uh, by Peter, by Simon Peter coming from Joppa to uh, Caesarea, to Caesarea. So we can see that 
basically, and I spoke about it in the first webcast, and I said, imagine that you had a mother that had given birth to you, and that mother falls into prostitution. What will be your reaction to your mother falling into prostitution? Would your reaction be to humiliate her some more? And maybe to skew her or kill her, murder her? In the name of Jesus Christ? Will your reaction be um, just going out and expose their nakedness? Or would your reaction be to hit the floor with your knees, crying out and repenting for your mother? Crying out and interceding for your mother in the same way that Moses in Exodus 32, 32 interceded for Israel after the golden calf experience and they went before Moses and before the Almighty, he went before Yahweh and he said, if you're not going to forgive them, blot me out of the book of life that you have written. And that's basically what we're dealing with. We are not negating the fact that Israel has been in judgment in the nations and that 2,000 years of exile was a terrible punishment that Yahweh himself inflicted on us. We are not negating the fact that we become like the scapegoat in the nations because we did not transfer our sins to the scapegoat, Yeshua Mashiach, who fulfilled completely Yom Kippurim as written in Leviticus 16, where Abadi became both the goat of the guilt offering, of the sin offering, and he also became the scapegoat that goes into the wilderness and is cut off. We were cut off from the land of Israel, and we were like a scapegoat in the nations. The sin of the church is that it did not stand in the gap for Israel to be restored and be saved. And therefore, exile took even longer than usual. Exile could have been shorter Have we stand, have we, if we have, we're standing in the gap. Now, the issue is this one. And many people think, no, 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 God is in control. In other words, no, no, it had to be 2,000 years. No, the word doesn't speak about 2,000 years of exile. There's nowhere in the word that it says that you know that it has to be that way. Yahweh gave his authority to his believers down on earth in Matthew 28 and he said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth, therefore you go and make disciples for all nations. When I was visiting Auschwitz for the first time, I went to visit a church that was near the death camps of Birkenau. And the chimney was in the death camps of Birkenau and you understand that the chimney was constantly fed by the bodies, uh, uh, cremated bodies of the Jewish people that had been exterminated in the gas chambers, and that smoke kept on, you know, uh, polluting the sky. And uh, the people that were gathering in church to do their church meetings and pray during the time of the Shoah, the time of the Holocaust, they could have smelled the smell of the burning bodies, and they could have seen the smoke that was coming up, and they really knew what was happening in the camps. You could not not know. And yet, they did not stop it, and they continued their church services. That happened throughout Poland, by the way. And throughout Germany, the church services continued, and many times they prayed, Oh God, we just thank you for the privilege of being your executors of your judgment against this accursed people, Israel. Because that's what replacement theology is established. Israel is accursed. Truly, Israel was under the curse. But it says it's a curse of God forever. And the church has replaced Israel, and Israel shall never be. That was the biggest and most terrible surprise that many Christians had when actually the Israel was established back in its own land in 1948 with a reborn state in exactly the same land as given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jewish people from all over the world began to flock and come back. And Yahweh, in spite of all of the wars of Israel, in spite of all the Arab nations coming against us, and all the pressure of the nations were still here, Something began to shift, something began to change. And many people that were steeped in replacement theology thinking, well, these are cursed people, the Jews, they began to think twice and say, something is happening in Israel that I did not take into consideration. Therefore, the biggest sign that replacement theology is a lie is actually the ribbon state of Israel in its own land. And those people that have not taken heed of this sign and are still in that replacement theology are going to incur in the judgment of the nations together with the nations 
that have persecuted Israel and are now persecuting the reborn state of Israel politically in their own land. That's why I'm saying that this message is life and death for you, for your family, and for your nations. Now, even if you know the message, you're going to know it today to speak it in a way you've never spoken it before. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 30 and we're going to start right from the beginning. We're just going to read two entire chapters. The word which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, Thus says Adonai, the God of Israel, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. Yahweh says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Hmm. Interesting. Because I'm sitting today in Eilat, city in Israel, and I am sitting in this land having children that were first generation Israelis born in the land of Israel. And I know that this word has already come to pass. But this word was in the Bible when replacement theology was established as law and as kingdom doctrine or religious doctrine among the Christians. But yet they still believe that God was totally done away with Israel and he will never be able to bless us anymore. And yet Elohim says in many, many scriptures that the day is coming when he will restore us, he will restore the fortunes of Israel, he will restore the people to the land. This is in many, many scriptures throughout the world. Let's keep on reading. It says that we shall possess it. The same land that was given to our forefathers, we are going to possess it. Psalms 105 tells us that he remembers his covenant and to 1,000 generations, the land that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For those that are not aware of it, the land starts in the river Nile and ends in the river Euphrates. In other, God, in other words, it comprises all that we call the area of Assyria today, which is Iraq, Iran, Syria, and all the way to um, Egypt, including the Sinai Desert for those that are not aware of this. Now, these are the words which Yahweh spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says Yahweh, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Alas! For that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, or many Bibles say Jacob's trouble. But he will be saved from it. Okay, my dear, I'm going to dispel another theology right this moment. Many people talk about the week of Jacob's trouble. Equating the last week of Daniel with the time of Jacob's trouble that is described here in Jeremiah 30. And therefore they say that after the church is ruptured, Israel is going to go through the week of Jacob's trouble, a terrible, terrible, terrible time mm. of judgment. That is the biggest, fattest lie and misconception that has accompanied many Christians throughout many generations. It is totally rooted in replacement theology. First of all, the word of Elohim does not tell us the week of Jacob's trouble. It talks to us about the time of Jacob's trouble. And it says clearly that, that it says there is none like it in that day. And if we continue reading, it says, he will be saved from it. It shall come about on that day, declares Yavet Sevaoth, the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and will tear off their bonds, and strangers will no longer make them their slaves, but they shall serve Yahweh their Elohim and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares Yahweh, and do not be dismayed, Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar, and your offspring from the land of their captivity, and Jacob will return, and will be quiet and at ease, and no one will make him afraid. 
for I am with you, declares Yahweh, to save you. For I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished. Keep on reading and you will see this week of Jacob's trouble and how Yahweh is going to destroy all of the nations, but not Israel. And we're going to see what what the day, what the season, or what the time of Jacob's trouble is, and certainly it is not after the rapture. For thus says Yahweh, your wound is incurable, and your injury is serious. There is no one to plead your cause. No healing for your sore, no recovery for you. No one has interceded for you, no one to plead your cause. All your lovers have forgotten you, they do not seek you. For I have wounded you, notice who is wounded Israel. He said, I have wounded you with a wound of an enemy, with a punishment of a cruel one. Notice the words that are used here, cruel one. Because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. Why do you cry out over your injury? This is all about Israel. Your pain is incurable because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. I have done these things to you. Notice who has done them. I have done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour... Therefore, look at this. I have done these things against you. Therefore, all who devour you will be devoured. And all your adversaries, every one of them will go into captivity. And those who plunder you will be for plunder. And all who prey upon you will give for prey. For I will restore you, Israel, to health. And I will heal you of your wounds, declares Yahweh. Because they have called you an outcast, saying it is Zion. No one cares for her. Now let's go and take a look at this which we have just read. Notice, first of all, the promise is... I will restore you and I will bring you back. And then it says, but you're going to go through a time of Jacob's trouble. But you are going to be saved out of it and I will bring you back from all the lands of your captivity. I will now destroy all the nations that came against you, all those that plundered you, all those that took you into captivity, and all those that said to you, you're Zion, nobody cares for her. And that's exactly replacement theology. That's exactly what replacement theology spoke about. It says, Zion, Yahweh doesn't care for Zion anymore. It's accursed, and it is accursed forever. It is here talking about, clearly about the Christians that were in replacement theology until now. Until now. Yeah. Until this moment. Well, don't shut me down so quickly. Notice that it says, I, Yahweh, did it to Israel. I wounded Israel with the wounds of a cruel one. Now you tell me, in the history of mankind, if there has been anything more cruel than the Holocaust, than the Shoah. It is enough for you to go to Auschwitz. It is enough for you to visit that museum and you're going to see bunches of hair from Jewish women that were taken off their hair when they were taken captive into the concentration and death camps. And they were made into textile for the Nazi, for the Third Reich. Some people in Germany are still using suits made out of Jewish hair. Now, on top of it, the fat of the body of the Jewish people we used to make soap. Maybe people still have old soaps from that time. It's made out of the fat of our people. Now, on top of it, you see in Auschwitz quantities of shoes and suitcases and every kind of thing in there. When you just hear a couple of stories about what happened to us during the Holocaust, and I'm going to name it Shoah, because Holocaust is a pleasing sacrifice to God, and certainly that's exactly what the church thought about at that time, said, well, this is a pleasing sacrifice to God because these Jews are accursed, they rejected Jesus Christ, and therefore that we are burning them is actually an act of service to the Most High God. So they called it Holocaust. But the real name is Shoah, which means utter devastation or utter destruction. So it's enough to hear two 
three stories of what happened to us during the Shoah and see some of the elements that have been left from the Shoah to understand that they could never, nobody could ever invent anything more cruel that the Nazi regime invented. That no demon can be worse than that demon because there is no imagination that can even fathom and grasp the quantity of cruelty. And yet among the Christians that are steeped in replacement theology, still speaking about a week to come of Jacob's trouble. You don't think that it's been enough? Yahweh indeed punished us. And this is something very important for my people. Because my people, many times we feel like a victim, that's the Jewish people, but we need to realize that the biggest sin for Israel has been rejecting Yeshua HaMashiach. And therefore, we were seriously punished. The Shoah was definitely a terrible judgment and a punishment over us. Because for 2,000 years in the nations, we still kept on rejecting Yeshua HaMashiach, except that we couldn't see him anymore in the church because he had changed names and he was called Jesus Christ. And he was dressed in pagan garments rather than Jewish garments, so we could not recognize our Messiah in that Jesus Christ. He's celebrating different feasts and he hated Israel. So we couldn't recognize him. So now, you see, the sin of Israel is obvious. We, as a nation, we rejected Yeshua. And because of that, we had many more sins. We chose a religious, orthodox, Jewish system rather than the kingdom system. Many, many sins came out of that. Until today. However, Yahweh is telling us here something very serious. He's saying, I wounded Israel. I behave cruelly with my own people because of your great iniquities because you were cut off from the land and went into the curse rather than blessing by rejecting my son the messiah the Yom Kippurim, the only atonement that i sent you so that you will choose kingdom rather than religion however he says that those nations that were used to execute that judgment will be completely destroyed. In other words, they cannot be gloating and saying, well, we killed those Jews. They will be completely destroyed. They will be given for plunder. They will be given for prey. They will go into captivity. At the time that Yahweh restores the fortunes of Israel, automatically the, judge, the judgment falls on the nations. In other words, what happens here is this, and we need to understand, we need to be like the sons of Issachar, that understand the timings. During the time of our exile, for 2,000 years, we indeed were under punishment and judgment. From the moment after the Shoah that this scripture is fulfilled, and we actually are rescued, are saved from under the Shoah, and to establish the nation, the state of Israel, from that moment, Israel is no more under judgment, the nations are under judgment. From that moment, Yahweh begins to extend grace and mercy to his own people, knowing that their wound is incurable. In other words, no psychiatrist, no psychologist can really heal the wound of the Shoah. You talk with any person that has ever gone through the Shoah, even people that never went through the death camps, but they were alive as Jews at the time and they suffered the terror of being in, Jew in, in Europe during that time. They are scarred for life until this very moment. They have an incurable wound that the only way to have that wound healed is through the Messiah Yeshua. Therefore he says, I will heal your wounds. I will heal your wounds. Only he can heal the wounds of Israel. When Israel turns to Yeshua, the wounds can be healed. Hallelujah. Praise the living Yah. So there is a promise for the healing of the wounds, but there is a promise for the restoration of Israel, grace extended to Israel, and now the complete judgment of the nations. Now, the church in the nations that was with replacement theology, that didn't even stand up to stop the Shoah, that church is basically judged together with the nation. Of Germany and Poland. Now, not only the church in Germany and Poland, the church all over the world, because the world was silent. Now let's think for a moment here, and let me take you back to Auschwitz with me. 
when I was visiting Auschwitz for the first time, and I was near that church that I knew was continuing the services, seeing the smoke coming out of the chimneys, smelling the bodies of Jews, I asked Elohim a question. And I said, Abba, how could we have prevented this horrendous devastation from happening? His answer was not, I had to judge no matter what. He only told me one thing. He said there was no Esther church at that time. I was quite amazed. I said to myself, there was no Esther church at that time. What did Esther do? Esther identified with her own people and interceded for the life of the Jewish people that were in danger of annihilation because of the wicked plot of Haman, the counselor to the king. In other words, at that time, there was no church that would identify with Israel. No church that would go before the government and the ungodly governments of the time. Most of them Christian governments, by the way. No church that would arise and go to the kings of the nations and say, wait a moment, we have to stop this. We cannot allow Hitler to do this. There was no intercessor for Israel at the time. There was no church like Esther that knew her identity as a Jew. The church didn't know that without the Jews, there is no church. The church at that time didn't know that the gospel is made in Zion and not in Rome and in Babylon. The church was steeped in that replacement theology that has murdered so many Jews during all the generations since 325 and on. And so there was no Esther church. From that moment I began to research, you know, what is it? How, how, can, we, how can we do this? How can we make an Esther church to happen? Well, that, of course, led to what we call today the map revolution message of repentance to the nations, whereby we call the church in its entirety, from north to south, east to west, every denomination, to completely repent and cast out and uproot every traces of replacement theology from within them. And if they do not do so, Yahweh spoke to me clearly that the same judgment that the nations will suffer for the way they've treated Israel will also suffer the church that is not completely repented and removed and cast out replacement theology from them. Now that's not going to be enough and we're going to continue reading and we're going to see that also there is a call for restitution. In other words, it's not enough just to cast out, repent and remove replacement theology and approve replacement theology and all that demonic theology, but on top of it, there needs to be restitution. Without restitution, Yahweh cannot bless the church in those nations, and therefore cannot bless the nations. For as the church goes, so will go the nations. So let's continue reading. Knowing fully well right now that there is not such a thing as the week of Jacob's trouble. It has happened already. It happened during the Shoah. Yahweh said that he will definitely not leave us unpunished, but he said clearly that we will be restored and unfortunately restored after the time of distress of Jacob's trouble. After then, we will be restored into the land, which is of obviously the Shoah, the Nazi Holocaust. Now let's go a little bit, just keep your hand in Jeremiah 30 and we're going to go to Isaiah 40. And now we're going to understand it very clearly. And we will see how Yahweh relates to Israel at this time. Comfort, or oh comfort my people, says your Elohim. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. So we can see here that Yahweh acknowledges that we have received double for all our sins. How could I have received double for all our sins? Isn't Yahweh a just God? Why did he give us double? because the nations took it even further than he intended to go. And it, they took it further because of the Christian church. And that's the point here. I know this is sometimes a hard thing to hear, but it was because of the Christian church and replacement theology that it was taken further because every kind of pogrom and Shoah negated the Jewish people until now has been in the name of Jesus Christ and because the Jews killed Christ, supposedly. 
many other times I've talked I talked to you that the Jews could not kill Christ because of the Messiah, because we didn't have jurisdiction at that time. We had autonomy, and as an autonomy, we could not execute the death penalty. So the Romans killed Christ, and when they were nailing him to the cross, it was about them that he was saying, "Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do." Otherwise, they didn't know what they were doing, crucifying the Son of Elohim. And of course, it's forgive, forgiveness for all, but the Roman soldiers were crucifying him, and they taunted him, and they put the crown of thorn on him, and they spat on him, and they pulled his beard so that we all know and understand. And that because of that one thing, then Jews, Jewish people have been killed all day long, saying, because you killed Christ, you killed Christ, you murdered Christ. Now, no doubt that our rejection of Messiah Definitely. Our rejection of the Torah, our rejection of the laws of God, definitely brought Yeshua to the cross to pay for our sins so that we can be saved. Now, let's go back to Jeremiah. Um, actually, you know what, let me see something else here I want to take. Um, mm -hmm. See if I find something else here that I want to show you. Uh, no. Let's go right back to Jeremiah 30 again, though there's, I could go through Isaiah 40 in the same way I'm going through Jeremiah 30, but let's go back here. And so we know now that in verse 17 of Jeremiah 30, it says, For I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of your wounds, declares Yahweh, because they have called you an outcast, saying, It is Zion, no one cares for her. If you go through the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial with me, you're going to see uh, sculptures that were in every church for many centuries and even today sometimes you may find it there were the two sculptures of Judea vanquished and church triumphant and that was exactly the, the, the signs that were put in the churches throughout many generations that Jews are all vanquished because they rejected Jesus Christ but the church is triumphant because we have Jesus Christ so they called her outcast saying it is Zion no one cares for her that says Yahweh, Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob, and have compassion on his dwelling places, and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin, and the palace will stand on its rightful place. From them will proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who celebrate, and I will multiply them and they will not be diminished. <laughs> I will also honor them and they will not be insignificant. How many of you agree that Israel is not really insignificant today? Their children also will be as formerly, and their congregation shall be established before me. And I will punish all their oppressors. How many of their oppressors will be punished? All. Oh. Oh. How many nations are under judgment? Oh. Oh. That's what it says. Their leader shall be one of them, and their rulers shall come forth from their midst. And I will bring him near, and he shall approach me. For who would dare to risk his life to approach me, declares Yahweh. You shall be my people and I will be your Elohim. In other words, it talks about restoration to the land, healing of our wounds, and eventually even salvation through Yeshua HaMashiach, so that we will be his people and he will be our Elohim. Behold, here it comes, the tempest of Yahweh. Mark that scripture. Behold, the tempest of Yahweh. Wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of Yahweh will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days you will understand this. So what is it and how is it that he is executing this judgment that is talking about the nations that are come against Israel? The tempest. His wrath goes out in the form of storms. How many of you know about the global warming or the global warning and how the storms have made ravages throughout many nations, Far East included, and in some nations there is terrible drought, in other nations there is too much water. There is a clear judgment on the nations that is happening through storm. And it is prophesied right here in this book at the time that Yahweh restores the people of Israel to the to our own land and begins to heal our wounds, the nation's coming under judgment. Now let's continue to Jeremiah 31. At that time declares Yahweh, I will be the Elohim, the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says Yahweh, the people who survived the sword 
found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when I went to find its rest. Yahweh appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. How could replacement theology be established saying that the people are cursed forever with scriptures like this? You know why? Because according to replacement theology, the doctrine said that the church had replaced Israel and therefore all of the scriptures that belong to Israel are now applied to the church. In other words, they interpreted, I've loved you with an everlasting love to the church, but not to Israel. That is where the deception comes in. I love you with an everlasting love, therefore I've drawn you with loving kindness. Yahweh is drawing Israel with loving kindness, not with judgment at this point in time. Yes, 2,000 years with judgment, now with loving kindness. We're in different seasons. Can you say different seasons? Different seasons. And the different season starts when? When does it start? 16th of May of 1948. We entered into a different season. When Israel was established as a state. Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt, O Virgin of Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. I tell you what was the landmark of the pioneers as established the settlements of Israel. They brought life to this desert land. Tambourines and dancing and hora and all kinds of dancing. That came with singing and dancing and a restoration of praise and worship. And so it says, hmm. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. Samaria, that according to the plan that had been instigated by President Obama and the nations of the world, should uproot all of the Israeli settlements by, um, by about seven months from now. And uh, that would be against the covenant here, because it says that again we will plant vineyards in Samaria. The planters will plant and will enjoy them. For there will be a day when a watchman, when watchmen on the hills of Ephraim call out, arise and let us go up to Zion to Yahweh our Elohim. Sorry, May 14, 1998. I, I, I mentioned the date wrong because my husband was born in May, May 16. And so I said May 16 of 1948, but it's just corrected me. I remembered his birthday, which is a very important date, I agree. But actually the day that it changed was May 14th of 1948. So it's not like I don't know the date, but I, I think I love my husband too. <laughs> so anyways, we go back here and it says that the watchman, now the word in Hebrew for watchman in the Hebrew Bible is not srim. Notzrim is also the same word we use today for Christians. Yeah. So it says, yeah, Christians will arise, watchmen. Christians are supposed to be watchmen for the house of Israel. Amen. And they're supposed to be intercessors for Israel, not judges. And, and that the Christians will arise, and they will say, let us go to Zion, okay? In, to the Lord our God. It says, For thus says Yahweh, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, proclaim, give praise, and say, O Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. In other words, the assignment for the Nazarene, the assignment for those in the nations, are to cry out and to say and to speak and to sing what about the restoration of Israel? And to cry out for Yahweh to save Israel and to bring it back home. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she who is in labor with child together. Believe me, the people that arrived from the Shoah looked exactly like this, what is being now described. The lame and the blind and the woman in labor and the destitute. All these were brought out of the Shoah to establish the new born state of Israel. A great company, they will return here. It happened and it is still happening till this day. With weeping they will come men, they were weeping. They were completely weeping and kissed the soil when they arrived to Israel. With weeping they will come. When I arrived from Chile, not from the Shah in 1970, I came weeping. And by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim 
is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Avail nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off, and say, Again, hear all nations, declare in the coastlands afar off what coastlands were anybody that has a coast, and anybody that is an island. It's a say, speak this out loud and say, He who has scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For Yahweh has ransomed Jacob and redeemed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. How many would agree that Hitler was stronger than the Jewish people at that time? But he said, I've they've been redeemed from him that was stronger than he. They will come and shout for joy on the height of Zion. And they will be radiant over the bounty of Adonai. Over the grain and the new wine and the oil and over the young of the flock and the herd and their life will be like a watered garden and they will never languish again. People, those that have been in Egypt and sometimes they come from Egypt to Israel, they tell me this, I can't believe it, it's like the same climate, but the moment we crossed over to Israel, green, green, a desert is displaced by green and we come into another atmosphere altogether. Hallelujah, that's exactly what it's speaking about. And so it says, uh, they will never languish again. It says, Then the virgin will rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. Notice that all the time of the restoration of Israel to the land is under grace, not under judgment. Well, the judgment is falling on the nations. And where the call and the cry goes out to the Christians, who are not streaming the nations, to say, Come up to Zion. Stand in the gap for Israel, cry out for Jacob to be restored, sing in your songs, in your worship songs, everywhere. Just put this thing about the restoration of Israel in there. And that is the act of restitution of the church in the nations towards Israel, to stand in the gap. When they do that towards Israel, then Yahweh can consider listening to their intercession for their nations. And this is where many go wrong. They are interceding for the nations, standing in the gap for the nations, but not for Israel. And what happens is that unless they stand for Israel in intercession and in action, coming up to Zion, working actively for the restoration of Israel, then basically their cries for intercession for their nations will not be heard. This is very important because the nations are under judgment they are under complete judgment. All the nations are under judgment. So yeah, you understand that this has happened already in the past. It's not going to happen in the future. Go with me to Isaiah 34. Judgment has already been decreed. It was decreed many, many years ago. Thousands of years ago. To be more exact, about 2,500 years ago. And it says this, draw nations. Draw near all nations to hear and listen, all peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear and the word and all that springs from it. For Yahweh's indignation is against all the nations. How many nations? All the nations. And it's again, you can see that he's repeating and repeating and repeating all the nations. And his wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. And you say, why on earth have you given up the nations for slaughter? You go right into verse 8. And it says, for Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. A day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. But let's go right back to Jeremiah 31 and understand that the season that we are in is Israel is being restored. Israel being restored is not under judgment, but under extended grace. The nations now have come into the judgment by storm. And they have already been given over to the slaughter because of the cause of Zion and the way they behave with Zion. Do you understand what that means? Mm -hmm. It means that unless the church rises up to reject replacement theology to, and, and, to, and to stand in the gap for the restoration of it, to make restitution for the sins committed in the name of Jesus Christ in past generations, then Yahweh will not heed to your intercession for your nation. Not until this happens. 
and therefore your nation is under serious and severe judgment. And you cannot hope for anything good until you repent from replacement theology and you begin to obey the calling to work actively, pray actively, come actively for the restoration of Israeli land. That goes for any church, even that has the biggest anointing for signs, wonders, and miracles. It goes for any place where even demons are cast out. It goes for any denomination at all. If you're not actively involved in crying out in the chief of the nations, in putting the restoration of Israel in your worship and your songs, in coming to Zion, in standing with Israel, in fighting with us in the spirit, in crying out for our restoration, then basically you are doomed with the nations that are under the judgment because of the cause of Zion. And that is a serious issue because in 1994 when I wrote my book, The Healing Power of the Roots, after I gave my first Jewish Roots or Back to the Roots seminar in Switzerland, in Herisau, Switzerland, the German part of Switzerland, and when I started that seminar, Yahweh fell on me with a cry saying, Cain, where is your brother Abel? Your blood is calling to me from the ground. Now this is neutral Switzerland I'm talking about. Christian Switzerland, supposed to be. And when I spoke that under the unction, the repentance that began to break through in that place was so serious. People were weeping, crying, screaming. And then people that were not even born again, they were Christians, nominals or backsliders or whatever, or just secular that happened to be in that meeting, a stumble into this meeting. They got born again in the midst of that repentance. Because it is only that repentance concerning the sins committed to Israel that will bring new birth to the people in your nations. It will bring revival to the people in your nations. That repentance that leads to restitution towards Israel and the Jewish people in an active fashion and in prayer, that will lead people in your nations to repent, will bring revival even in the midst of judgment. The question is, will Yahweh find a Queen Esther this time? Will Yahweh find somebody or a church, a body of Yeshua, a bride, that will identify with Israel? Not judge it, identify with it until she is fully restored? That is the question. And identify with her by going into the government and expressing exactly what I'm speaking about right now. Saying to the governments of the nations, starting with the government of the church, don't dare to go to the nation if you have not called the church to repentance. Because if the church doesn't come to repentance, what can we expect of the nations? In First Peter, um, 417 it says that judgment must begin in the house of God and if barely the righteous is saved again out goes the one saved over saved doctrine if barely the righteous are saved what will be of the ungodly and the sinner and the judgment has started first in the church because of the cause of Zion beloved that is the major cause of judgment in the nation is the cause of Zion. Because Genesis 12, 3, that promise that Elohim gave to Abraham, a covenant promise, he said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The reason why I'm speaking about this message is the biggest act of mercy from Yahweh to the nations. Why would a Jew come to the nations, say to them, repent for the sins you've committed against us? Because Yahweh wants to have mercy on the nations. And he knows that unless the church repents in the nations for replacement theology and actively involves in the restoration of Israel, then he will have completely to annihilate all of the nations as he has spoken. And he doesn't want to do it. He wants to have many sons and daughters into glory. But it cannot happen unless the church repents. And time is very late, so 
As I'm saying, when I wrote that book, The Healing Power of the Roots, and there was tremendous repentance and revival, I went back to Israel on the land plane and then asked uh, the Israeli airlines plane, and I asked Shevan, and I said, Lord, why? What is such a big deal about me preaching about the Jewish roots to the nations? And Yahweh spoke to me and he said, it is a matter of life and death. And death. It is a matter of life and death because the church has been like a beautiful rose cut off from her garden for two days. And on the third day, if she's not replanted back, she will surely die. One day is uh, like a thousand years unto the Lord. Two days is two thousand years. The third day is the third millennium. We have entered into the third millennium. And if the church is not replanted back into the olive tree with Israel, uprooting all traces of replacement theology, uprooting any kind of apathy about Israel, uprooting all the mixture of paganism that comes with replacement theology Christianity, then she will surely die. And I, I, I never fully understood and said, but how, what do you mean she will surely die? Well, it's written very clearly here that at the time of the restoration of Israel, the nations that have plundered Israel, and they were all Christian nations, they will be completely judged. So I understood, therefore, that if the church of the 21st century doesn't repent for the sins committed before, and even until this day concerning Israel, and even through politics, then the church of now will die. Will, die, will be cut off the olive tree and will be dead spiritually. It will incur in the same judgment that the nations that you belong to. My cry, this Yom Kippurim, this day of atonement in Israel, is that you will repent personally and for the sins of your ancestors. And you will take now your place, crying out from the chief of the nations and declaring the restoration of Israel in your singing, in your prayers, in your writings, in your books. And actively work for the restoration of Israel by coming here financially and in every other way that he have able show you. And he has spoken in his word. We are about to finish this part B of the webcast. There will be a part C. We're going to go into the third part in five minutes after we go off the air. The third part will be prayer. It will be a prayer of repentance. We'll start from there. And we invite you to join us in that prayer of repentance as well as we have people from the nations in this uh, prayer tower. And uh, we are going to proceed also to pray more for the salvation of Israel and the restoration of Israel all the way until sunset in Israel, which will be about 7 o'clock, where we are going to blow the last shofar. According to the scriptures, when the last shofar blows, the dead will rise. The last shofar is the shofar of resurrection. So God bless you again. I'm leaving you right now in this place. And we are going to move directly into uh, the third part, uh, which is after, the, after we finish the webcast here. Those of you that feel from the Lord immediately to give offerings of restitution and repentance, go and press online giving as well. Uh, you can do it right there from the internet. You can do that. And it is definitely important to do that. So. God bless you again. We'll be back in five minutes. Stay put.